Welcome to Hive Mind. This is The Sharp Edge. I'm here today to break down part four of the cancer within modern medicine. This one is all about manipulation of the minds. There is a cancer within what we now know of as modern medicine. It is eating away at the very heart of its original design. Rather than saving and healing humanity, this cancer seeks to destroy us from within. As we continue to dissect the cancer within, in this segment of the report, we'll be talking about the area of mind control and those who have shaped the minds of the masses since the turn of the 20th century. I'd like to give a special thanks to pathologist and friend, Dr. B, for contributions to this research and report. Manipulation of the Unconscious Mind the study of the unconscious mind gained wide attention at the turn of the 20th century through the research of Sigmund Freud, who popularized the concept that the conscious mind represents only the tip of the iceberg, while a vastly larger portion of the mind remains hidden below the surface. Freud postulated that the repressed thoughts, emotions, memories, impulses, and wishes of the unconscious mind are the primary source of human behavior and he sought to analyze the hidden realm of the unconscious mind through the founding of psychoanalysis. Freud's psychoanalytic theory of personality heavily focused on the sexual drive of humans with an emphasis on incest and various developmental states, which he defined as the oral, anal, and phallic phases. Much of Freud's theories, including the Oedipus complex, originated from the analysis of his own dreams. He believed that dreams provided access to unconscious thoughts and desires. Freud's theories revolutionized the field of psychology and intrigued the psychiatric community to pursue the study of the unconscious mind further. His practice of psychotherapy dominated the early half of the 20th century which launched the practice of many variations of Freud's concepts and theories that are still influential in psychology to this day. So convinced that mankind could not rise above our animalistic instincts without the guidance of leaders, in 1927, Freud wrote in his The Future of an Illusion, For masses are lazy and unintelligent. They have no love for instinctual renunciation. It is only through the influence of individuals who can set an example and whom masses recognize as their leaders that they can be induced to perform the work and undergo the renunciations on which the existence of civilization depends. Revelations of Freud's theories of the unconscious mind inevitably led to areas of research by individuals, foundations, institutions, and government programs for the purposes of manipulating and controlling the unconscious minds of the people. Manipulation of the masses. Since the emergence of Freudian theory in the early 20th century, a select few with power and influence have sought to manipulate the subconscious minds of the world population in order to bend them to their will. Studies and ways to subconsciously manipulate the masses in order to manufacture consent of the people branched off from Freud's psychoanalytic theories. The Tavistock Institute was one such organization that did rely heavily on Freudian theory. They were well known for the studies of the psychoanalytic theories of Freud, and with funding from the British royal family, the Rothschilds, and later the Rockefeller Foundation, the Tavistock Institute for Human Relations became a leading disseminator of covert propaganda for the purposes of manipulating the masses. The Tavistock Institute for Human Relations has had a profound effect on the moral, spiritual, cultural, political, and economic policies of the United States of America and Great Britain. It has been in the front line of the attack on the U.S. Constitution and state constitutions. No group did more to propagandize the U.S. to participate in World War I at a time when the majority of the American people were opposed to it. 
Much of the same tactics were used by the social science scientists at Tavistock to get the United States into World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Serbia, and both wars in Iraq. This was a statement made by the former MI6 intelligence officer, John Coleman, who wrote the book, The Tavistock Institute for Human Relations, Shaping the Moral, Spiritual, Cultural, Political, and Economic Decline of the United States. Vice presidents of the Tavistock Institute during the early years included Sigmund Freud, Carl Jung, and H.G. Wells. The Tavistock Clinic is where Sigmund Freud settled after fleeing from the Nazis during World War II. Also during World War II, the headquarters for the British Psychological Warfare, which also dictated the psychological warfare strategy of the United States, that was headquartered at Tavistock. German psychologist Kurt Lewin, who headed the Tavistock Institute, emigrated to the United States in 1933, and he founded Harvard Psychological Clinic as well as the Center for Group Dynamics at MIT, where his colleagues worked in coordination with the OSS and later the CIA in the areas of espionage, psychological warfare, propaganda, and mind control. Known as the founder of social psychology, it was Kurt Lewin who coined the term group dynamics. Kurt Lewin's propaganda machine played a key role in engineering a public consent for the United States to take part in World War II. Freud's nephew, Edward Bernays, and Walter Lippmann were leading the charge by the Tavistock Institute to spearhead a campaign to manufacture consent by the masses for the United States' involvement in World War I. Freud's nephew, Edward Bernays, was an early proponent of Freudian theory who adopted the belief that from his uncle that Society was inherently irrational, and manipulation of the masses must be employed to control them. Bernays was a master of persuasion, which eventually earned him a title as the father of public relations. His 1925 book entitled Propaganda illustrates how Bernays used his uncle's theories of the subconscious mind to enforce mind control over the masses by manufacturing consent, stating, The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governed, our minds are molded, our tastes are formed, our ideas suggested largely by men we have never heard of. This is a logical result of the way in which our democratic society is organized. Vast numbers of human beings must cooperate in this manner if they are to live together as a smoothly functioning society. And almost Every act of our daily lives, whether in a sphere of politics or business, in our social conduct, or our ethical thinking, we are dominated by the relatively small number of persons who understand the mental processes and social patterns of the masses. It is they who pull the wires which control the public mind. The father of public relations, Edward Bernays, who authored the 1925 book Propaganda, postulated, if we understand the mechanism and motives of the group mind, is it not possible to control and regiment the masses according to our will without their knowing it? Bernays' mastery of manipulation of the public impressed Hitler's Minister of Propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, so much so that he applied Bernays' techniques to win over the German public with fascist ideology. In the early 1950s, Bernays assisted the CIA with a propaganda campaign aimed at American citizens 
to manufacture support for the overthrow of the democratically elected Guatemalan president, Jacobo Arbenz Guzman, by painting the president as a communist rather than a reformer seeking to break free from the CIA-backed United Fruit Company, which had imposed its will upon Guatemala and other South American countries for decades. Then Secretary of State John Foster Dulles had a personal connection to the United Fruit Company as his law firm represented the company and his brother Alan Dulles, then director of the CIA, was a board member. The term Banana Republic was coined from the CIA coup d'etat to overthrow a duly elected president and install a puppet dictator in Guatemala in favor of the United Fruit Company's position in the region. Bernays worked closely with the intelligence community over the decades, corresponding with the head of the CIA, Alan Dulles, on numerous occasions. The mastery of manipulation of the public's perception achieved by Freud's nephew, Edward Bernays, significantly contributed to the CIA's interest in the expansion of such an endeavor, and ultimately led to the launch of the CIA's program, Project Mockingbird, in the early 1950s under Alan Dulles. The large-scale operation designed to control the media for the purposes of propaganda and manipulating the minds of the public reportedly included an estimated 3,000 CIA operatives and 400 journalists. Freud's own daughter, Anna, was one of the earliest advocates of Freudian theory. While Sigmund Freud worked almost entirely with adults, Anna pursued psychoanalytic theory with children. When her father's health began to decline, Anna Freud took on the role of secretary of the International Psychoanalytic Association, where she later became the honorary president until her death. Anna's friend and partner, Dorothy Burlingham, who was the heiress to the Tiffany and Co. Fortune, provided all four of her children for psychoanalysis under the care of Anna Freud. Freud's psychoanalysis proved to be a failure, though, in the cases of Dorothy's son, Robert Burlingham Jr., who committed suicide in 1970, and daughter, Maybe, who committed suicide in Freud's home in 1974. With the clout from her father's name and reputation, Anna Freud went on to fill her father's role in the psychoanalytic movement. Despite the personal failures of treatment for Dorothy's children, she co-authored a series of books with legal scholars who specialized in child custody, and that heavily influenced the revision of child custody laws for the decades to follow. The popularity of psychoanalysis permeated the mainstream consciousness through media and Hollywood films by the 1950s and 60s. Actors like Marlon Brando, Dustin Hoffman, Cary Grant, Judy Garland, they were all very influenced by their time on the couch, which in many cases proved to be more detrimental than therapeutic. Such was the case for Judy Garland. Her sister recalled when she stated, Analysis had a lot to do with her change of personality, which led to Judy's abuse of alcohol and pills. Marilyn Monroe, another outspoken proponent of psychoanalytic theory, was surrounded and heavily influenced by therapists under the mentorship and guidance of Anna Freud at the time of her death. And a large portion of Monroe's estate was awarded to the Anna Freud Center. In recent decades, licensing royalties have generated more than a million per year for the Monroe estate, sums that far exceed all of the income Marilyn received while she was alive. The center, which was financially struggling at the time, benefited from Monroe's legacy, sparking criticisms of perhaps ulterior motives among the psychoanalysts who oversaw Monroe's care at the time of her death. From the public relations dynasty of Freud's nephew, Edward Bernays, Sigmund Freud's grandson, Matthew Freud, founded the most prominent independent public relations firm in Britain, Freud Communications, in 1985. Matthew married the daughter of another media mogul, Robert Murdoch. Aside from sneaky PR tactics to influence the masses, like his predecessor, Edward Bernays, Matthew, who has been dubbed the Great Manipulator, was forced to spin a much more personal PR nightmare, uh, which included the accusations that his father, Clement Freud, was a pedophile. The former British broadcaster and politician, Clement Freud, who is accused of child sex abuse and rape, had a villa in Portugal near the location of Madeleine McCann's abduction. 
prompting police to launch a probe into Clement Freud's possible connection to Madeleine McCann's disappearance. Clement Freud had befriended Jerry and Kate McCann and invited the couple to his villa in the two months after Madeleine's disappearance. Following the disappearance of Madeleine McCann, the McCann spokesperson, Clarence Mitchell, who was a former BBC news anchor, and he also held a senior post for the British Media Monitoring Unit, which is a unit of the government that's tasked to control the narrative and manipulate public perception. He was hired by none other than Freud Communications as a consultant specializing in quote-unquote crisis and issues management. Freudian theories, which emerged in the early 20th century, are immersed in our culture to this present day, and they've spawned the concept of manipulating the masses through the manufacture of consent by way of the media, public relations, and Hollywood. And they've allowed the power of a select few to control and subvert the will of the people. Freud's nephew and the father of public relations, Edward Bernays, explained it clearly when he stated, There is an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governed, our minds are molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested, largely by men we have never heard of. Moving on to mind control. Heavily steeped in Freudian theory, the field of psychiatry in the mid-20th century steered research into manipulation of the subconscious mind, which led to government-backed experiments into mind control. While Nazi eugenics research was being conducted in Germany in the areas of genetic engineering and behavior modification, those were overseen by Heinrich Himmler and conducted by Joseph Mengele. Uh, There was research going on simultaneously in the areas of behavior and mind control focused at London's Tavistock Institute. And Tavistock's German-Jewish director, Kurt Lewin, who emigrated to America in 1933, oversaw much of the early research in the United States, which led to the CIA mind control project known as MKUltra. The clandestine project spearheaded by the CIA conducted experiments on humans with the use of psychoactive drugs and chemicals, electroshock, sensory deprivation, hypnosis, and even sexual abuse for the purposes of manipulating the mental state of the subjects and controlling their minds. At least 80 institutions were used for the CIA's mind studies, including hospitals, prisons, pharmaceutical companies, and 44 colleges or universities. According to the 1977 House Intelligence Committee hearing on MKUltra, the CIA's Program of Research and Behavioral Modification, there were 149 MKUltra sub-projects, many of which appear to have some connection with research into behavior modification, drug acquisition, and testing or administering drugs surreptitiously. As a poison expert who became known as the Black Sorcerer, Sidney Godleib joined the CIA in 1951, where he later oversaw the chemical division of the technical services staff. The CIA had aptly named a part of their technical services division the Health Alteration Committee, from which a number of chemical and biological weapons using poisons were derived for the purpose of assassinations under Project MK Naomi. Gottlieb also oversaw covert MKUltra projects, which included drug experiments, including LSD, on unconsenting subjects for the purposes of mind control. Through the CIA, front organization known as the Society for Human Ecology and the Geishichter Fund, Gottlieb sponsored a host of MKUltra mind control experiments conducted by Ewan Cameron, Harris, Isbell, and a host of other institutions and doctors. The horrendous human experiments on unwitting test subjects ruined countless lives of victims, even resulting in death in some cases. Frank Olson was one such case. He was recruited to work for the U.S. Army Biological Warfare's laboratory under Ira Baldwin. Olson became a senior bacteriologist, and he was reassigned to work under the technical services staff overseen by Sidney Gottlieb. While on a retreat with other technical services staff members, Gottlieb spiked 
Frank Olson's drink with LSD. Frank Olson subsequently experienced a mental breakdown in the days and weeks to follow and was put under the care of Harold Abramson, a doctor whose research contributed to the MK Ultra program. On the final night of his treatment in New York, Frank Olson fell from the 10th floor of his hotel room. And, of course, they ruled the death a suicide, though suspicions of foul play were abound following revelations of Frank Olson's unwitting participation in Gottlieb's MK Ultra experiment. While Sidney Gottlieb was known as the Black Sorcerer, Ewan Cameron earned the title Dr. Frankenstein. Dr. Ewan Cameron performed experimental studies of subjects in several institutions which, which contributed to the MKUltra program as executive officer of Worcester State Hospital Research Division in 1937. Cameron conducted experiments using the drug metrazole in patients with schizophrenia. Interestingly, Sigmund Freud specifically chose that hospital to visit in America in 1909 upon his only first and only visit to America. Metrosol injections of patients were known to induce violent seizures and invoke an overwhelming sense of terror within the subjects, which, as the doctors who administered the drug noted, the fear of rep repetition of the medication is actually what contributed to its success. Without any studies to provide proof of long-term success of the drug for treating schizophrenia, by 1939, 70% of hospitals in the country were using metrosol to treat mentally ill patients. The Allen Memorial Institute at McGill University was founded in 1942 through grants by the Rockefeller Foundation, of course, and the donation of the Ravenscrag Mansion for use as a psychiatric hospital. Dr. Cameron became the first director and first chairman of the Department of Psychiatry there. Stables of the old Victorian mansion were converted into laboratories and later became sensory de deprivation chambers for Dr. Cameron to perform his experiments. And Dr. Cameron pioneered the procedure of psychic driving and depatterning of patients. In essence, what he was doing was placing psychiatric patients into a medically induced sleep for 20 to 30 day periods, giving them doses of mind altering drugs like LSD and giving them intense electroshock treatments while they were forced to listen to a recorded message played on a loop. The goals of Cameron's experiments were to break down the patient's personality to a near childlike state in order to rebuild them and have them make different behavioral decisions. The appalling mind control experiments of Dr. Ewan Cameron, which became known as the Montreal Experiments, fell under the CIA subproject 68. Decades later, a class action lawsuit was filed against the Canadian and U.S. governments for Dr. Cameron's government-sponsored experiments, equating to that of an electronic lobotomy, which destroyed the lives of, of his patients and their families. The Canadian government settled 77 claims by Cameron's victims, awarding them $100,000 each, while 250 claims were rejected. Though Cameron is remembered as a Dr. Frankenstein of psychiatry, at the time, he was revered as one of the leading psychiatrists in the world. Cameron was president of the American Psychiatric Association from 1952 to 1953. He was president of the Canadian Psychiatric Association from 58 to 59 and president of the World Psychiatric Association in 1961. Cameron helped to found the Canadian division of the World Federation for Mental Health, which was headed by John Reese who was an expert in social psychology and was also key founder of the Tavistock Clinic. Director of Research for the National Institute of Mental Health Addiction Research Center, Harris Isbell, was another doctor whose work contributed to the MKUltra program. Though his early research was focused on the study of physical addictions to opiates and barbiturates, Isbell's work that was funded by the CIA focused on the study of LSD on incarcerated drug addicts. Inmates who underwent the experimentation were compensated with their choice of a reduced sentence or narcotics. Since the inmates were all drug addicts, one recovering addict recalled, the majority chose narcotics. In just one of Isbell's studies on tolerance levels of the psychoactive drug, subjects were administered up to quadruple 
the normal doses of LSD for 77 consecutive days. Lewis, Jolly, and West researched methods of controlling human behavior while serving as residency at Cornell University, the Center for the Human Ecology Fund, which was funding a lot of MKUltra projects. He later served as Chief of Psychiatry Service at the U.S. Air Force Hospital on Lackland Air Force Base. Then he became chairman of the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Oklahoma, where some other MK Ultra projects were conducted. Under Subproject 43, West was contracted to study the, in the areas of hypnosis and suggestibility, dissociative states, hallucinogens, and the psychology of racial violence. Interestingly, it was Louis Jolly and West who was tasked to perform the psychiatric evaluation of Jack Ruby and the months following the assassination of JFK. For two decades, Louis Jolly and West served as head of the Neuropsychiatric Institute at UCLA. In most recent years, UCLA's medical school received $200 million from Hollywood mogul David Geffen. The school was subsequently named the David Geffen Medical School of, at UCLA, which is fitting as the neuropsychiatric hospital has provided psychological treatments for a number of Hollywood celebrities, such as Britney Spears and Kanye West, both of whom have been suspected that they may have undergone mind control experimentation. Though the CIA claims that all MK Ultra mind control experimentation has ceased, institutions like the Neuropsychiatric Hospital at the David Geffen Medical School, which was formerly run by MK Ultra psychiatrist Louis Jolly and West, leave researchers like myself to wonder if the mind control practices of their former director have carried on. Since the study of the unconscious mind was popularized in the early part of the 20th century by Freudian theory, efforts to manipulate, exploit, and control the subconscious minds of the masses have taken form. This cancer within the world of mental health care is eating away at the very heart of its original design. Rather than treating mental illness, this cancer within seeks to control our minds. That concludes part four of the series, The Cancer Within Modern Medicine. Stay tuned for part five, which will be coming out very soon on transhumanism. Thanks for joining us here on Hive Mind. We'll see you soon.